Good morning. Good Chicles, the country church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. How many here this morning have not heard the term catch and release? Okay, most of y'all are fishermen then. <laughs> fishermen have heard that term. Ba basically, it means there are places you can fish, catch all that you can, but you can't keep them. You can catch, but you must release. When I thought about that, I thought that's Paul and Silas, and that's their situation. They were caught, but they couldn't keep them, amen? They were released, but, without make, they, but not without making a splash. Well, several thoughts as we consider their prison experience. Notice verse 25 and 26. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. Now you have to have a sanctified imagination here. You got to try to grasp this picture. Scripture says they were beaten with many stripes, bloodied, bruised, beaten with many stripes. Then they were thrown into prison and their feet put in stocks. Now, here's the unusual thing. In the midst of all of this, Paul and Silas start having a prayer meeting. They start having a praise service. And all of the old Gaither hymns, they were singing. I don't know about that, but they did have a, a praise service there. And it, and it wasn't a quiet and subdued service. They weren't just praying to themselves. I mean, all of the prisoners heard them. Some of you, well, I don't have a good voice. Nowhere does it say you got to have a good voice. It says you make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And if you croak, do it for Jesus. But uh, all of the prisoners heard them praising the Lord. All of the prisoners were there in that prayer service, whether they wanted to be or whether they didn't. You see, their testimony affected all of them. You know what? Your testimony and my testimony affects people all around us. Now, to me, what a difference between them and now, then and now. I read in Acts 5, 40 and 41. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. You see that over and over in the word of God, that they praise God to be counted worthy to suffer for his sake. You know what we do? Whine. We had a lady in this church used to tell her husband, be a man, start whining. <laughs> that, uh, well, anyway, Notice this death out of despair. Here on the one hand, they're having a praise service and they're having a prayer service. At the same tone, token, there's despair there. Verse 27, the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, 
supposing that the prisoners had fled. He saw the prison doors open, realized he had forsaken his responsibilities, and he attempted to take his own life. You know why? Because he knew what the magistrates wanted to deal out was going to be a lot worse than taking his own life. They frowned heavily on lost prisoners. Do you know that today there's over 132 suicides per day? That's, that's unreal. Well, people who commit suicide reach a point where they don't feel they can come out of it. It's really sad, but that's the point that they reach. They feel that their situation is helpless, their situation is hopeless, and they need a solution right now. And many times fear is the motivator and the devil is the encourager. He's the one that fans that flame. Some of them have said, you know, well, uh, I'll just end my life and that's all there is to it. No, there's not. Every one of us here is an eternal being and we will live eternally one place or the other. Well, praise God, there was hope on the horizon. Paul cried with a loud voice, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. And then he called for a light and he sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Let me tell you something. Isn't it amazing how quickly the Lord can turn around a situation? I mean, you can be down and out two strikes and waiting for the third and then God shows up and takes that situation and turns it around in a nanosecond. I, I'm sure there's a nanosecond out there somewhere, but... Uh, well, a lot of times fear is the motivator, the devil's the encourager, and says, just turn loose. Now I've got, I might as well get this in there for free. This doesn't cost you a dime. But there are a lot of people that uh, say, well, I was about ready to die and I saw this bright light at the end of the tunnel. And I, I knew it was the Lord. Well, I've heard people say that, that weren't a believer. They were not a Christian. And they, quote unquote, saw this bright light. Now, I've got a feeling about that. What I see is, if you are a believer, sometimes the devil will want you to turn loose so you won't serve the Lord anymore. And if he can get you out of here, he'd be tickled to death. And if you're an unbeliever and you see this bright light, it's the devil saying, come on, turn loose, let go. And when you turn loose, you wake up in hell, you see. Well, there's hope on the horizon, and thank the Lord for his ability to turn things around. On the one hand, there were clouds of despair and depression and darkness, and then he turns them around to hope and to light and to well-being. You're ready to fall on your sword? You ever been there? <laughs> and uh, you cry out. And God says, fear not, for I have everything under control. Don't you just love that hymn? Men's hearts today are falling, failing for fear. It seems the end is very near. Our ship is leaning and the billows roll, but God has everything under control. Earthquakes and wars and problems of man, he holds them all in the palm of his hand. I'll fear no evil, for I'm in his fold. My Father has everything under control. And we need to fall many times all the way down to that, to realize that my Father has everything under control. Do yourself no harm, for we're all here. <laughs> Don't you know that was a relief? 
What do you think was going on in that old boy's heart? Don't, don't harm yourself. We're all here. You're safe, buddy. I imagine there was a relief that was boiling up in him like he'd never seen before. So he calls for a light. And he came trembling. And he fell down before the ones that he had beaten. Isn't that something? He had already witnessed a miracle. And let me tell you something. The best was yet to come. Just the fact that he trembled wasn't enough. Just the fact that he fell down wasn't enough. But it was going to be enough before it was all over. Because he was saved by grace. Verse 30 and 30 through 32. And he brought him out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. <clears throat> and they spake unto him the words of the Lord and to all that were in his house. I, I love this passage. I love the simplicity of the gospel and God's plan for salvation. <clears throat> Sometimes we don't realize how simple it is. And we skate right on past the gate. The jailer didn't ask for the salvation process. He gets right to the point. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I, I can't think of a sweeter note than to have and to hear somebody ask that question. What do I have to do to be saved? Isn't it something that man always wants to know? What can I do? What must I do to be saved? It's grace alone, brother. Grace alone. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. You're not worthy of it, but Jesus still wants you saved. Well, you could be sitting here this morning knowing that you're not saved <coughs> and wondering, why would Jesus want to save you? Seems like we go from one extreme to the other. On the one extreme, why wouldn't he want to save me? I mean, he'd be getting something good. No, he wouldn't. He had to scrape off the bottom of the, to, to get you and me. And on the other hand, there's people that think, how can I be saved, considering what I've done, who I am? Well, thank the Lord <coughs> that he loves us. Thank the Lord for John 3:16. It's more appropriate not even at a football game where they hang it out over the deal. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever that believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the kind of love that you'll only find in the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know what a blessing that was. What an eye-opener that was. When I realized that I couldn't do anything to merit his love. That his love transcended anything that I could ever bring to the table. And God doesn't wait for us to get it all together. Praise God. I don't know about you. But I tried to get it all together for a long time. And I try to hold my mouth just right. <laughs> and I try to just do this and just try to do that. Anything to make myself worthy of, of the Lord. And all I did was wear myself out. <laughs> well, God doesn't wait for us to get it all together. He reaches down to the guttermost and lifts us up to the uttermost. I read an article the other day that said, I think it was in England, that uh, a lady was had on a pair of real fine gloves, 
but she put her diamond ring on the outside of the glove rather than on the inside so people could see it. And the ring slipped off and it fell in the muck in the mire along the curb. And she got a little stick and she tried to stir around in the mud, couldn't find the ring. Finally, she took her glove off and reached down into that muck and went through it and lifted up the ring that was precious. When I see that, that's what Jesus did for me. He reached down into the muck and the mire and lifted me up and put my feet upon the solid rock, which is Christ Jesus. Well, Paul said something I can't forget. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And so will your household if they believe. In other words, it's not just for you, it's for your whole family. Verse 32 says, And they spake unto him the word of the, spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. Nehemiah 8.3 says, And he read therefore before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. You know, we have a nursery, we have a cry room, we have a children's church, we have all of these. But there's some words that just ring in my head, Brother Neil, and that was from Brother Folks. And I apologize one time for the kids acting up or whatever. He said, let me say this. He said, they don't bother me. He said, if your feet didn't touch the floor and you didn't understand what the old boy was saying, you'd wiggle too. So he said, don't worry about the kids. He said, worry about mom and dad. They do the same wiggling, <laughs> and their feet touch the floor. Well, I believe that when the Lord saves a person, he has their whole family in mind. I want you to think about that and let that soak in. When the Lord saves a person, he has their whole family in mind. And he's caused us and counted us to be an ambassador for him. If you've been reconciled to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that then you and I have this ministry of reconciliation. We're to bring fallen men and women back to God the Father through the saving blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Now, I want you to notice the changed life. Verse 33 and 34 says, And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all of his, immediately, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. Notice the evidence of a changed life. There was the evidence of repentance. Those that he had beaten, he now bathed their wounds. Is there evidence of repentance in your life? When you realize what the Lord has saved you from and what he saved you to? You know, the Bible says the goodness of the Lord leads us to repentance. It's not just a bony preacher pointing his finger and saying repent or perish. The goodness of the Lord ought to lead you and me to repentance. Well, secondly, he was baptized in his house. It, it's amazing what can happen in a home when the father leads the way. 
It's a little weak, but it's still true. <laughs> it's amazing what can happen. I, I've had guys say, well, my wife has all the religion in our family. And I think she's probably got all the relationship in your family, too. You know. But, Mom, you're not off scot-free. I remember Lydia in this same chapter. Well, notice that they fellowship together. Uh, around his table, there was rejoicing and talking and sharing about the Lord. You know, we'd be a lot further down the road, wouldn't we? If we had this type of rejoicing. I mean, you could rejoice just because you were around the table. Well, anyway, fellowship together, rejoicing and talking. And another evidence, Paul and Silas were his enemies and now they had become his friends. Isn't it amazing how when you're saved, you become a part of the family of God? It's a wonderful thing. We sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family the family of God. What a difference it makes when we are saved and we God's given us this whole new family. Had a couple come up to me today and said, you know, our parents are not here. That's why we need a strong church. We need brothers and sisters who will pray for us, who will lift us up in our family. Well, Notice the matter of going out gracefully, and I love this. Verse 35 says, And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeants, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told his saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, Oh, no. Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, have cast us into prison, and now do they thrust us out privately? Nay, verily. But let them come themselves and fetch us out. Don't you just love this? I mean, Paul and Silas were real men. Just because they were Christians didn't mean that they checked their manhood at the altar. No, they were, they were real men. Hey, you've beaten us openly, and you expect us to go out privately with our tail between our legs? No way, Jose. Jose was one of the jailers. <laughs> but... Uh, you don't need to send a messenger saying, depart in peace. Let them come in person and ask us to leave. We didn't come here under the cover of darkness. And bless the Lord, we're not leaving the same way. Amen. You notice how their attitude changed and the climate? Verse 39, they, they apologized. And they begged them to leave the city. Get out of here. You know, we can't take a whole lot of this. Just go away. Acts 17, 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city. Listen now. Crying, those, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. These ones who've turned the world upside down, they're here. You see, these crazy disciples, they wanted to bring everybody under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Folks, we're not trying to turn the world upside down. It already is. We're trying to turn it right side up again. 
by calling people to faith in Christ. That's the only thing that's going to do it. You can't legislate it. You can't vote it in. But you can bless the Lord. You can pray it in. We're not there to turn it upside down. We're there to turn it right side up. Well, comforting the brethren. And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison, entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. <clears throat> now think about it. With all that they had been through, they comforted the brethren. All that they had been through, all the sorrow, all the pain, all the sadness, and yet they were the ones who comforted the brethren. Boy, what a lesson for us right there. Instead of us retreating, get our little nanny, suck our thumb, we're to be the ones doing the comforting. Our God is able. Have you ever gone to encourage a child of God and they wound up encouraging you? It happens to me all the time. I'm going to do this really good thing and I'm going to go encourage them. And when I leave, leave there, I realize, hey, I'm the one who's been encouraged. It wasn't any sacrifice for me. It was a blessing to me to go because I wound up being blessed. It's, it's really something when we get outside ourselves and we reach out to others. How does that old saying go? I cried because I had no feet and then I met a man who, I, I cried because I had no shoes and then I met a man who had no feet. Makes a difference. Well, big question. Where do you stand this morning? If you were to die today, do you know that you'd be with Jesus? If you were to stand before the Lord and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Well, I've attended church every Sunday. Brr. Well, I, I've been a good person. Brr. You know, what would you say? Could you say, I remember when you convicted me of my sin and openly and publicly and unashamedly I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Well, have you identified with him as a believer in scriptural baptism by immersion? The other Sunday we had two young boys that it was the first time ever that they'd been to church. First time ever. And the one of them told his grandmother, he said, I want to go next Sunday and see people baptized. And she said, well, we don't baptize every Sunday. And he said, why not? You, yeah, it's out of the mouth of babes that the truth comes. Why not? And have you planted your life in a Bible-believing church? Because today the invitation is for you. Uh, I've shared this before and I'll share it again. You all sing Amazing Grace more than once, and I'm going to tell you my stories more than once. But I was in Perryton, Texas, and if you don't know where Perryton, Texas is, it's 40 miles south of Liberal, Kansas. I mean, when you're that far up in the panhandle, you get nosebleed. It's so high up there. But I was in Perryton, Texas, and... Uh, I know you won't believe this, but I've been critical of other pastors. <laughs> and especially the ones that say, I was going to 
preach this message out of Joshua, and God changed my heart, and God changed my message, and so I'm going to go with John 3.16. And I want to say, you sorry, lazy thing, you ain't studied all week long. (laughs) And now you want to go with something easy and, and, and take that. Well, I've, I've skinned more than one pastor that way. And then I got up there in Periton, and it was the last day of the revival. And I had my message all laid out and prepared. Yeah, somebody said, uh-oh, and boy, they hit, him, hit it on the head right there. I, started, I was sitting there, had my Bible, and the Lord said, you're going to preach that message? I said, Lord, I'll I'll preach it the best I can, and I'll give a real strong invitation. And he said, if it's the last message that they hear, that's the message you're going to preach? I said, dear Lord, please don't change my message. (laughs) I mean, I, I begged him. James, I begged him. Please don't change my message. And God kept dealing with me, and I... I said, in between breaths, I said, Lord, if I was going to change the message, what should I preach on? (laughs) And he gave me a passage, and I hadn't studied it. I hadn't prayed. I didn't have three points and a poem. I didn't have anything. And I got up and did the best I could with that passage. And when I got through... I don't know how many people we had saved. I saw the women dealing with some women over here and they were leading them to the Lord. I saw the youth and their helpers and they were leading teenagers to the Lord. I saw men coming to know the Lord and all because somebody was obedient to the Lord and did what God said do. But the amazing thing is A guy drove up in the parking lot who had been to church. Service was over. He was going home. And he sat in the carport with the engine running. And he told his wife, I'm going back. She said, what do you mean going back? He said, if I put off another day from accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll die without him. And he turned around and went back to the church. And the preacher led him to the Lord in the parking lot, close, close. And some of you this morning may be that close. It's God giving you a chance today. He's giving you a time today to make that decision for his honor and his glory. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart. Because every time you harden your heart, to the gospel, it gets easier the next time and the next time. Today is the day to make that decision. Let's stand and pray. Father, we do thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we thank you for your power. We thank you for your presence. We thankful, we're thankful for what you want to do. We're Thankful for what you will do if we'll let go and let you have your way. All across the auditorium, people are praying that decisions would be made to bring glory to the Lord Jesus. In our prayers, join them. And we pray for lives to be changed by the power of the gospel. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. God speaks on that first note, that first invitation hymn. Will you let go and let God have his way? Will you do it? Just like you are. You're turning loose. You're letting go. And you're trusting the Lord. Lord, this is the decision that you've laid on my heart.
and I'm going to make it for your glory. Just like you are. <coughs> you know what you need to do? One thing. Turn loose. Turn loose. Let go. Let God have his way. their instruments continue to play let God speak to your heart this whole service could have been orchestrated for you that's how much the Lord loves you that's how much, how much he loves you that's how much he wants to draw you unto himself we open it up for another verse if no one comes, you're saying it's well with my soul. But I really believe that God's speaking to some folks today. Will you come? Lord, I surrender. I'm giving up and I'm giving over to you. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. For just a moment, now a word from our sponsor. You know, from that passage, there was great success from the preacher preaching in stocks. I don't know how much they cost. We could order a set of those. <laughs> Guests, we want to uh, just take an opportunity to thank you for, uh, for joining us today in worship. Um, if there's any way we can minister to you, please indicate on your guest card, uh, and we would love uh, to be able to, to minister to you. Hopefully you've read your bulletin, uh, but it's always good if I read part of it to you. Uh, so a big thing coming up here in, in just around the corner is Vacation Bible School, okay? So there's information in there on, on, on that event. Uh, know where you need to be, and there's a place to register there uh, online. Um, the Attic Ministry, wow. In June, 57 households ministered to, 166 people, two new clients, and two salvations. That's great. I'm going to stop right there and let our pastor share the decisions, and then I'll continue on. This morning, Jessica and Benjamin Hager come both saved, both identified, and want to plant their life here. And Michael and Janet Smelser 
They're both saved, both identified, and the Lord's led them here. And if you rejoice with them, <laughs> amen. Amen. You be sure and offer to them the right hand of Christian fellowship. Let them know that you love them. You're glad that they're here. Amen. Now we continue with what's his name? Part two. <laughs> Remember the baby bottle boomerang for our South Texas Pregnancy Care Center? Just wanted to remind you of that. There's an event happening next week. It's big. It's called Youth Camp, right? Yeah. Um, so cannot emphasize enough uh, the, the need for us to lift that group up in prayer uh, daily for them. Uh, many of them will have an opportunity to encounter Christ uh, to be saved and also to be to have a life change and so let me encourage you to be in prayer for that we appreciate everyone who picked up the offering envelopes and and c contributed uh, to make sure that we don't deny any young person an opportunity to have uh, that kind of experience uh, we also have um, a kind of a witness card that's available in the back uh, it's if you're if you those of you went to this the witnessing class uh, it's a card you can hand out to an individual and on the back if they click on it with their cell phone it plays um, um, basically a salvation um, message uh, for them so it's really handy it's it'll be in the back there for you just wanted to make you uh, aware of that and don't forget we have prayer meeting today at five o'clock in the fellowship hall that's all i have thanks that um, little card at the back the evangelism card that you can give out has a qr code on it and if they they click that with their cell phone the, um, the evangelism presentation is about a five-minute little video that Brother Butch did. So you'll, you'll be, able to, they'll be able to hear a gospel presentation from Brother Butch with that little evangelism card. So pick some of those up. Just, you know, leave them, leave them after you eat lunch today. Now leave a tip, too, but be a good, be a good witness. And I um, would encourage you also, our, uh, the Country Church Bookstore is, is uh, open um, before and after services. Betty Money has some CDs. She sang this morning. If you'd like to avail yourself to some of those, there's other good um, good opportunities there at the Country Church Bookstore. So let's stand together, and um, Brother Keith, would you come and close us out in prayer, and then we'll sing sing our way out. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the, this day that you bless us with, Lord. Lord, thank you for, for your word going out um, this morning. We pray that it touched people's hearts. Lord, we thank you for those new members to our family, Lord. Lord, we want to lift them up in prayer, Lord, and I know they want to lift us up in prayer as well, too, Lord, uh, that we can continue to grow in you and edify you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the, the outreaches from the church and, and trying to touch the community, Lord. Lord, con classic yesterday, and we pray that 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 word would go out and, and all our other ministries that are out there, Lord, as well. Um, in your name we pray, amen. Hallelujah.